Hell yeah, brother. I don't even want to, let's just, can we talk about the Iowa school shooting? A little bit of a lighter story. We begin our report with another shooting in America, this time at a school in Perry, Iowa. Officials say a 17-year-old student fired on classmates in the building Thursday morning. A sixth grader was killed. Five others, including a school administrator, suffered non-life-threatening injuries. CBS News's Ed O'Keefe reports. It was the first day back to school in Perry, Iowa, after the winter holiday, when at 7.37 a.m., shots rang out. Security activation at Perry High School is possible. Gunshots. Within seven minutes, the first officers arrived, followed by more than 100 others from local, state, and federal agencies. Officers immediately attempted to locate the source of the threat and quickly found what appeared to be the shooter with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The shooter identified... The shooter took himself out. What brave cops! ...fied a 17-year-old Dylan Butler, a student at the school. He shot and killed a sixth grader and wounded five others, including the school's principal, Dan Marburger. All the victims were rushed to nearby hospitals in Des Moines. I couldn't believe it. I, honestly, I just, I was just shook. Officials say the shooter used a pump-action shotgun and a handgun. They also located and disarmed an improvised explosive device inside the school. Butler also made a number of social media posts in and around the time of the shooting. Law enforcement is working to secure those pieces of evidence. Among the students who escaped, Jody Kurth's stepson, Xander, who lives just two blocks from school. He'd been grazed by a bullet and came back for medical attention. It was absolutely horrifying. Like this. One of the worst moments of my entire life, but the best phone call I got was saying that they were okay. This is the second school shooting already this year. In the last five years, 161 people have been killed in school shootings, with more than 300 injured. And Ed joins us now from Perry, Iowa. Ed, the police arrived on the scene within seven minutes. Uh, that seems very fast. How were they able to... That's fast? ...respond so quickly. Well, John, uh, as cliche as it may sound, this is a small town, and, and they, were, they were not that far away. Uh, you know, first officer within minutes, hundreds, though, uh, you know, within an hour or so. Local, state, and federal response to this FBI and ATF, in part because of the discovery of that improvised explosive device, uh, and also because the FBI now often does get involved <clears throat> in shootings that occur at schools like this. This is a town of 8,000, about 40 miles north of Des Moines, uh, once a big rail center, uh, now just uh, one of those quintessential Midwestern small towns. Where now today just a rotten uh, piece of exurbia that has no purpose and maybe some old rotten houses and retirees and a couple of uh, no hope young people who are really nothing more than the American refuse swirling up in the bowl. Day, people were saying they can't believe it happened here. As they do in all of the towns where this happens. Ed, you're out there, of course, because they're Republican yeah. presidential candidates and there's about to be the caucuses. Um, how have they responded to this shooting? So they've all been asked about it today, John. Nikki Haley, a little while ago, tweeting that uh, her, you know, no student, parent, or teacher should have to wake up and face news about a school shooting. My heart aches for the victims of Perry, Iowa, and the entire community. She may face more questions about that tonight in a primetime town hall on another network. Ron DeSantis was asked about it earlier today and made clear that he thinks these kinds of incidents are local and state matters, and there isn't necessarily anything for the federal government to do. Donald Trump hasn't weighed in yet, but Vivek Ramaswamy there tweeting this morning, pray for the community in Perry, Iowa. Pray he to, to be what? here in Perry, mm. Iowa, shortly after the shooting, met with some locals 
to talk about the issue more broadly, didn't offer necessarily any solutions, but was eager to hear from people. Mm -hmm. We asked Iowa's Republican Governor Kim Reynolds, who supports DeSantis in that news conference earlier, what she thinks GOP presidential contenders should be saying about school violence and guns in the closing days of the caucus, and all she said was, they can decide for themselves what to say. <laughs> I love our, I love American politics. It's very good. The second thing is we have to secure our schools the same way we secure our airports and our courthouses. And that means we make sure that we have whatever we need to to make sure nothing comes through bullet wise or otherwise we need to have a security officer at the front of every school we need to have one point of entry no side or rear entries and then we need to make sure that we have someone on staff not a guidance counselor but a mental health counselor that does nothing but look to see which kids may be in crisis that sounds like welfare, providing free mental health care. We got to provide free mental health care just to prevent, not to actually help kids, but to make sure that they don't do a school shooting because that would hurt our profits for the NRA and the gun manufacturers. And also, let's, let's uh, secure our schools like they're prisons. Let's spend billions of dollars on creating a security apparatus. Let's expand TSA to be in every elementary school. This is okay that school shooters, that shooters just go to the movie theater. Shooters just go to the, like, uh, what is every single place? Am I supposed to go through 80 medical metal detectors a day? What is this shit? Let's start there. That's at least doing something. But we have to do something. This is heartbreaking. I will. The second thing is we have to secure our school. I had to check a regular drive from the Perry police to the high school is six minutes. Yeah, that sounds about right. The same way we secure our airports and our courthouses. And that means we make sure that. If you grow up in South Carolina, literally in second and third grade, you learn about slavery. You grow up and you have, you know, I had black friends growing up. In South Carolina, you learn why the black people live in the bad part of town. It is a very talked about, if you grow up in... I'm just, what can he say, man? What could we say? Of course, it's not just those victims and their families uh, impacted by this violence. Everyone in that school this morning is at home right now. They're having to carry this tragedy with them and process it uh, throughout the day. Larissa Leone spoke to one of the students who unfortunately saw part of this scene unfold. We're going to go to her now with that. Larissa, what can you tell us? Stephanie, I feel like the word tragedy doesn't even explain what happened today at Perry Middle and High School. I spoke to one student who says if it wasn't for his intuition, he doesn't believe he would be alive today. I woke up a normal day, took a shower, and then on my way to school. I walked in right away, went to the restroom to just stand there for a while until lunch or breakfast opened up. And as I was waiting there, I heard someone moving around. And I looked through the little crack in the stall, and I realized it was um, Dylan. And as he looked at me through the crack, he opened his duffel bag and hooked it up. And right away, like, I stood there for a couple more minutes, and my body just told me, like, you're not supposed to be here. Leave. I went to the other restroom, 
and use the restroom and I washed my hands and right as I left I walked around the corner to the lunchroom and I heard like five bangs. I saw people running towards me telling me to run so I turned around and I tried helping people alongside me telling them to run and they followed and we exited the building. One of my friends, he's in critical condition in surgery right now and it's just really sad to hear. I felt kind of stunned because I never thought in such a small town like Perry something like this would ever happen and when it really happens it's really more serious than you really think. It's just traumatizing because honestly he could have just killed me then and there and I wouldn't be here right now. Now, the small community of Perry is coming together in this time of need for a full list of vigils, community gatherings, and resources, mental health resources for students and faculty. Head to our website at weareiowa.com. In Perry, Larissa Leon, Local 5 News. School today in Perry, Iowa, after a shooting at a school yesterday where a sixth grader was killed. Police say a 17 year old student walked into his school yesterday morning and shot six people before the classes even began. Investigators haven't said anything about a motive for the shooting, but friends of the boys say he'd been bullied. I've been going to that school my entire life, and those kids would do horrible things to him. He got tired of the harassment. Was it a smart idea to shoot up the school? No. This is the internet zoomer brain. And, and listen, like, uh, my generation started it, you know? Columbine happened in, uh, what was that, 98? 2000, uh, 99. 99. I, I, my generation started that. But, like, the idea that the solution to being bullied is to get a gun and shoot up the bullies is a meme that has fully entered the bloodstream of Americans, especially American kids. Because that, this, this, this kind of like mentality is everywhere. It's rampant. I'm not saying that these students are saying it's good or anything like that. It's just, this is American culture now. Shoot up your school. God, no. And I, I am mad at him for that. Lord knows I am mad at him for that. Now, four of the injured people are students. The fifth is the principal of the school. When police searched the building, authorities found the suspect dead from a gunshot wound. A Los Angeles... All right, chat. Let's let's rotate our coverage over to looking at how America is going to get owned again. This time in electric vehicles. Because we have a terrible president You can't stop shoveling money into Elon Musk's pocket and letting him make all the decisions. It likes to describe itself as the biggest car brand you've never heard of. Now China's BYD has overtaken Tesla as the world's largest seller of electric vehicles. Even if you've never heard of BYD, there's a chance you've been in one of its buses.
while its taxis prowl the streets of some of the world's biggest cities. But buses and taxis aren't the reason why BYD has overtaken Tesla. It's because of Instead, China. It's a fruit of long-term strategic thinking on the part of BYD itself and the Chinese government. No, we can't do long-term strategic thinking. What? what about the quarterly profits? State grid. Wait, you're saying their utilities are owned by the government for the benefit of the people? Oh, ew, ew. They should privatize. Ew. And it's setting China up to be the dominant global player in the transportation of the future. Electric vehicles, a business that could be worth $8.8 .8 trillion by the end of a decade. Here are the three most important things that have made BYD the king of EVs. The Chinese government has played a huge role in BYD's rise. We've arguably never seen anything like this in terms of you know, the amount of support uh, that, that China has extended to automakers specifically pertaining to EVs. Beijing has given an estimated $30 billion of tax exemptions to the industry since 2010, and may waive a further $97 billion by 2027. China actually takes a carrot and stick approach. They set mandatory EV output targets for automakers, but they also offer cheaper loans and cheaper land and R&D subsidies to all those EV makers. Ew, ew, ew. The government is doing things to make their country better. Ew, we should do the market. Ew. Oh God, that's, uh, do you see how unfree they are? Ew. and BYD has been a massive beneficiary of that. It still sells most of its electric vehicles in its home market. But of course, Tesla has also benefited from Chinese subsidies, which is where the second reason for BYD's rise comes in. Most of BYD's cars are simply a lot cheaper than Tesla's. In fact, you're not allowed to own these. You're not allowed to buy them because there is a 30% tariff on any Chinese car. So you're not allowed to buy these. It sells 10 popular models starting from less than Tesla's cheapest offering for the Model 3 sedan. Guys, they're selling an electric car for 10 grand in China. and BYD sells a lot more of the cheaper vehicles in its lineup. They have very cheap models starting from 10,000 US dollars. Their approach has been extremely different in the sense that Elon Musk believed that you had to sort of start from the high end with a sexy performance car to get people interested in electric cars and then work your way down the price spectrum. BYD went at it from the other end, where it was about uh, cheap taxis and buses that needed a heck of a lot of batteries and really sort of, you know, drove down the prices of, of the batteries that they could put into passenger cars. Well, the average price paid for it. Now, you see, you may look at that and go, oh, of course, duh, duh. But you have to understand in America, we're not able to do anything because capitalists and neoliberal ideologues prevent us from ex exercising any kind of judgment. Tesla is about 45,000. The average BYD sells to roughly half that. That, of course, raises the question, how can I sell them so cheaply? The secret to that price tag lies in what is known as vertical integration. Our vertical integration capability gives us the flexibility in the fast response to the market trend, as well as the better support for brand developing and customer service. That's a fancy way of saying that they make 
a lot of the things that go into their vehicles themselves. Car makers usually buy most components from suppliers such as Bosch, Continental, and Aptiv. Volkswagen, for instance, only makes 35% of the parts in its ID3 electric car. Tesla, meanwhile, makes 68% of the parts that go into its Model 3 made in the US. BYD makes 75% of the parts that go into the SEAL, its flagship model. That's the, the $10,000 $10, model, I think. Wait, never mind. That's not. BYD I thought is the SEAL the was the cheap auto one. Maker that produces all of its batteries in house. That was hugely important during the pandemic when the supply chains were just absolutely in a state of chaos for the industry. The fact that BYD was in control of its own destiny gave them a huge leg up over the rest of the industry. And especially as it pertains to batteries, this is a company that has been in the battery space since the 1990s. BYD actually stands for Build Your Dreams. It started out in 1995 as a battery company. They make rechargeable batteries for mobile phones and other electronics products. And then the company got into the auto business in 2003. Making its own batteries and other components helps it reduce a lot of costs. That's attracted some big name investors. Call it the continued BYD promotional road show and investor Warren Buffett brought his buddy Bill Gates along for the ride here in Beijing. It was fantastic. I'm yeah. amazed at the quality of that vehicle. Warren Buffett was one of the biggest early investors in BYD through his holding company, Berkshire Hathaway. See, because the capitalists, they're allowed to invest in China. They're allowed to take advantage of Chinese production and development. You're not, you fucking peasant. Your job is going to be over outsourced to China. But you're not allowed to, oh, is China doing things that are incredibly intelligent and we should have done them before them because we were richer and more developed? Well, you see, our politicians are bribed. <laughs> I mean, this is one of those things that if you look at this, it's just fucking disgusting, man. And the battery technology might also give BYD a technological edge over some rivals. <laughs> it uses lithium iron phosphate, which is not only cheaper than other batteries, it's also packaged a lot more compactly. And chemistry is a core expertise of founder Wang Chongfu. He's sort of the anti-Elon Musk. Wang is a chemist by... China's gonna eat our lunch! Training and an engineer and an anecdote that one of our reporters was told was that when he was told he needed to dress up a bit for an investor meeting, he stopped to buy shirts just sort of off the street. And so he's far from one of the flashier executives uh, in the auto industry. This has all set BYD up to be the biggest player in electric vehicles. The question now is whether it can become one of the world's biggest car makers, full stop. Well, the West is going to try to block it in every possible way. They're not going to let Americans buy BYD cars for 10 grand. No. And that means growing outside of China. In 2021, BYD started to step up its global expansion. It started to launch more passenger vehicles across the global markets, including Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Europe. It's still a very new entrant in global markets. The volume contribution is rising, but still small. Even so, BYD inside three years has become one of the top selling EV brands in markets such as Thailand, Brazil, and Australia. It's also remains to be seen whether this company can, you know, quickly grow in, in some of these newer markets that it's entering where it isn't well known, it isn't recognized. The two most prominent- Even with a 30% tariff, isn't it cheaper? Well, then you have to- <laughs> That's just the tariff on the vehicle itself. Then you have to get an importer. You have to get an exporter. You have to secure passage on a container ship. Good luck because you're only buying one. 
You're going to have to pay fees. You're, I mean, there's like eight steps to importing a car. You're going to be at more. You're going to probably pay 15 grand on importing it. Challenges in BYD's global expansion will be first, uh, regulatory uncertainties, and second, brand awareness. The European Union is investigating into Chinese EV subsidies. Chinese automakers, they are exporting more of their EVs into Europe because those cars are produced in China, so the production costs are pretty low, which allows the automakers to set their prices in the Europe uh, cheaper than the European counterparts, which has been very alarming to the European auto industry. One way around that will be to increase the amount of local production. Definitely localization is one of the very important strategy of BYD's Europe uh, strategy. And so we are considering where evaluation different location in Europe and where we can build the cars. And apart from buses and trucks, BYD isn't in the US. The trade tensions between Beijing and Washington are keeping BYD back and giving them pause to entering the US Thanks, market. Thanks, Joe. For years, automotive experts have predicted established car making giants like GM, Volkswagen or Toyota would catch up with Tesla in electric vehicles. In hindsight, it probably shouldn't be a surprise that a Chinese rival got there first. So you can't have a $10,000 EV and you can't buy solar panels. Why is solar so expensive in the US? However, solar costs in the US remain higher than in other countries, most notably Australia, but just how much less expensive is solar in Australia? And is it possible for the US to slash solar costs even further? Australia has extremely higher solar adoption rate and most residential systems are priced at about 70 cents per watt. We've seen the cost of solar drop to $2.77 per watt. Mmm. Mmm. So it's three times more expensive to build solar system in America than it is in Australia. Mmm. <sighs> there you go. All right, well, let us talk about our uh, beautiful, amazing, uh, awesome allies. Can we, can we, Bernie Sanders did something right. Bernie Sanders did something right. Let's watch his, uh, Kyle's coverage of it. Because I think I might have an aneurysm if I keep talking. You know, it's one thing. The United States of America, you know, we voted for Obama and he said, oh, we're going to have a green industrial revolution. And then he did fucking nothing. He was a fucking loser. Uh, he broke that promise. So China went ahead and did it for real. And they're producing extremely cheap electric vehicles at extremely cheap solar panels. Now... If we had extremely cheap solar panels and extremely cheap EVs, a lot more people would use them. And we would be well on our way to uh, reducing climate emissions in America. Let's be honest. If things are cheap and they work just as well, people will buy them. So the United States failed to become a leader in solar panels, failed to become a leader in EVs that are inexpensive. China decided to do it, 
And instead of taking advantage of the billions of dollars that China invested in their production, we put tariffs on it. So not only do we not get the advantage of having this market in America, we also don't, are not allowed to buy those things from abroad. So we're in the perfect position of maximum failure. Thanks. Glad to hear it. Now we have a proxy state committing a genocide and Joe Biden is bending the rules to send them weapons. You think I mean? Um, look at this. United States hasn't formally assessed if Israel is violating human rights. The Biden administration has been deflecting accusations this week about Israel's actions in Gaza, saying its ally isn't committing acts of genocide, but it also acknowledges it conducted no formal assessment of whether Israel is violating international humanitarian law. Why not? Because they know they are. The lack of any real-time assessments of Israel's war conduct has fueled intense criticism from inside and outside the government as President Joe Biden shows no signs of wanting to change approach. Questions about the stance of an arisen in public sessions of the past two days coming on the heels of South Africa launching a genocide case against Israel at the United Nations top court. The U.S. is confident Israel isn't committing either ethnic cleansing or genocide in Gaza, a senior mission official told NatSec Daily. If you look at what Israel is doing, they aren't systemically targeting civilians. What? They're leveling every building! The U.S. came to that conclusion in part at looking at press reports and conversations with Israeli officials. Well, oh my goodness gracious, what would the world superpower do without the press? On Wednesday, State Department spokesman Matthew Miller said U.S. hadn't seen any acts of genocide perpetuated by Israel and Gaza. Pressed the following day on how the U.S. came to that determination, Miller said he wouldn't discuss internal deliberations or speak to any formal process that's been launched. Moments later, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby fielded a question at the White House about how the U.S. knows if Israel abides by the laws of war. I'm not aware of any kind of formal assessment being done by the United States government to analyze the compliance with international law by our partner Israel. We have not seen anything that would convince us that we need to take a different approach in terms of trying to help Israel defend itself. The administration issued an assessment of the Russian war crimes within a month of the Ukraine invasion. The U.S. has far more visibility into Israeli operations, so the claim that they've not been able to make such an assessment about Gaza after three months really strange credulity, said Matthew Does, executive vice president at the Progressive Center for International Policy. The Biden administration speaks more forcibly now about civilian protection than it did after Israel launched its war following Hamas's October 7th attack. But Washington has said very little about some of the intentions of top officials of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government. Be Benzel uh, Smotrich, Israel's finance minister who visited the country's war crabment, has repeatedly called for Palestinians to leave Gaza. What needs to be done in the Gaza Strip is to encourage immigration, he told Israeli army radio last month. If there are 100,000 or 200,000 Arabs in Gaza, not 2 million, the entire discussion of the day after will be totally different. Israel is also in talks with Congo and other nations about a voluntary migration plan for Palestinians in Gaza. This is basically Hitler's Madagascar plan. What the fuck? I didn't even hear about this. The Madagascar plan was a plan proposed by Nazi German government to forcibly relocate the Jewish population of Europe to the island of Madagascar. The proposal called for the handing over the control of Madagascar that a French colony to Germany as part of eventual peace term. The idea of resettling Polish Jews to Madagascar was invest investigated by the Polish government in 1937. The task force set to investigate the island's potential determined that only 5,000 to 7,000 families could be accommodated, or even as few as 500 families by some estimates.
Radmacher recommended on 3 June 1940 that Madagascar should be made available as a destination for the Jews of Europe. With Adolf Hitler's approval, Adolf Eichmann released a memorandum on 15th August 1940 calling for the resettlement of a million Jews per year for four years, with the island being governed as a police state under the SS. They assumed that many Jews would succumb to its heart's conditions should the plan be implemented. So basically, they're literally stealing. So it's not the Madagascar plan, chat. I'm sorry. It's the Congo plan. This is the time when, when Wikipedia is most useful, chatter. When I'm showing you a, his, a well-documented historical event where I could just show you that what I talked about, the Madagascar plan, what it was, what it existed, and some details. This is what it's for. My argument is that the Congo plan that the Nazi Zionists are advancing is very similar to what the Nazi Germans advanced called the Madagascar plan. Forcibly resettling a population into some underdeveloped portion of Africa that's different than me going, mm, what, what, uh, what is uh, uh, Israel-Palestine reading the Wikipedia and going, I'm an expert now. This is me. I knew about the Madagascar plan before, and I brought it up. See, I, I'm explaining this because it's important for you to understand the difference between somebody using Madagascar, like using Wikipedia as a uh, uh, validation of something I was saying before versus using Wikipedia as the basis for my knowledge. I learned about the Madagascar plan in my college history classes. I took a class in the history of genocides. I also read a book called The Root of Evil that I highly recommend if you want to uh, if you want to understand uh, genocides as part of my class. It might be the roots of evil. <sighs> The roots of evil, sorry. The origins of genocide and other group violence. That's why I know about genocide, because I read books about them. Anyway, moving on. Israel is also in talks with Congo and other nations about a voluntary migration plan for Palestinians. That talks about the Ar genocide of Armenians. It talks about, obviously, the Holocaust. It talks about a few different genocides. You want to see something funny? The key tactics here. And, I mean, that's a big blow that Argentina is now not joining. It's a pretty curious case, isn't it? It's a really strange. One. What, what, what's what going the on fuck? Here? What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? What's going on? What is that? Me when Vio is still playing Ayaya in her studio. Who's that? Who are you? What? How did you get in here? Who are you? Get out of here! Get Security! Out of here. Security! <laughs> What's going on? He has to make sure that the Russian flag is very creased. What creep. the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? The key tactics. Anyway, moving on. Back to Israel wants to do the Madagascar plan to Palestinians. Our problem is finding countries that are willing to absorb Gazans and we're working on it. This is literally what Hitler said. This is literally what Hitler said!
Between 1933 and 1941, the Nazis sought to make Ju Germany Judenrein, cleansed of Jews, by making life so difficult for the 525,000 German Jews that they would be forced to leave the country. By 1938, about 150,000 German Jews had already left. After Germany annexed Austria, however, an additional 185,000 Jews came under Nazi rule. Increasing per persecution and public displays of cruelty and violence following the Anschluss persuaded many German and Austrian Jews that they should immigrate. It was difficult for them to find countries willing to take them in, however, especially since the Nazi regime did not allow them to take most of their assets out of the country. A substantial percentage tried to go to the United States, but were unable to obtain the necessary immigration visas. The U.S. Congress had established immigration quotas in 1924 based on uh, eugenics. It sharply limited the number of immigrants from certain countries and discriminated against countries where, whose populations were considered racially or ethnically undesirable. Following the Anschluss, President Franklin D. Roosevelt called for an international conference that would discuss the plight of refugees seeking to flee Nazi Germany and establish an international organization to work for an overall solution to the refugee problem. In early 1938, uh, delegates from 32 countries and a number of non-governmental aid organizations met at the French resort of Evian on Lake Geneva. Roosevelt chose Myron C. Taylor, a businessman and close friend, to represent the United States for the conference. During the nine-day meeting, delegate after delegate rose to express sympathy for the refugees, but most countries, including the United States and Great Britain, offered excuses for not letting in more refugees. Only the Dominican Republic agreed to accept additional refugees. The offer came as President Rafael Trujillo, uh, I can't remember how to say this, sought both to rehabilitate his reputation following his government's massacre of black Haitians in 1937 and to bring white wealth into his country. Commenting on the Evian conference, the German government gleefully noted how astounding it was that four countries criticized Germany for its treatment of Jews, yet none of them opened their doors. This is exactly what Netanyahu is saying. He is a fucking Nazi! Trujillo. Thank you, chat. Netanyahu is identical to the Nazis. Identical shit. Like, this is what's impressive to me is how flagrant they are, how obviously Nazi they are. And Joe Biden, do you think Joe Biden doesn't know this stuff? I mean, he is a dumb son of a bitch. It is true. But like, Jesus fucking Christ. Following the events of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, pogroms of November 1938 were widely reported in graphic detail. 71% of Americans responding to a public poll at the time opposed changing immigration quotas to allow in more Jewish refugees. Even efforts by some Americans to rescue children failed. The Wa Wagner Rogers Bill, a 1939 proposal to admit 20,000 endangered Jewish refugee children over two years, was not supported by the Senate. The U.S. government did adopt measures to ensure that refugees received the maximum number of visas allowed under the quotas, but it could not change the quotas without the approval of Congress. There were several reasons the American public and Congress opposed increasing the number of Jewish refugees allowed to enter the country. The U.S. economy experienced a recession in 37-38 with unemployment rising to 20%. That's because uh, centrists of the Rep Democratic Party convinced Roosevelt to balance the budget that year. Again, I know my history. Mike, look at this. Jew Israeli Zionists are fighting more inventful ways to be just like Nazis. Oh, Jesus Christ. Israelis, Israel's Minister of Heritage, Ebalke Elayu, says Israel should find ways more painful than death for the Palestinians.
All right, so that's the context where Bernie Sanders has fucking had it. All right, y'all, welcome to the show. Welcome, welcome. I got a great show for you today. Uh, so I got to walk away and stretch Bernie my legs. Bernie Sanders right finally grows a pair, steps up, says the right thing on the issue of Israel. But yet it has to be said, he's really, really late to the party, isn't he? So we'll talk about all that. Then we'll get to... Um, we have new corruption allegations against Bob Menendez, and this guy is absolutely cartoonish in his corruption. I mean, he is like Nucky Thompson in the 1920s with how brazen he is with it. Then we'll talk about the upcoming Republican debate. Got some interesting tidbits on that. We have a devastating ad linking Donald Trump to Jeffrey Epstein. It shows just how close they were. And then later on in the show, we'll dive into the leaked strategy of the Biden campaign. We now know uh, more of how they're going to run. So there's a lot to say about that as well. Everybody do me a big favor. If you do one thing watching this channel, please click subscribe. Helps us in the algorithm massively. Costs you nothing at all. It's definitely, definitely appreciated. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into it here. Bernie Sanders calls for no more U.S. funding for Netanyahu's illegal, immoral, brutal, and grossly disproportionate war. Okay. So we're going to get uh, to more of the specifics in a second. But let me just say, this is the first time I think you can read his comments as like a real clean break with Israel where he's like, all right, you know what? Too much, too far, had enough. This has got to stop. So I guess credit for that. That's good. And I think he's actually the first senator to actually get to this place. There's been some senators calling for a ceasefire and Bernie notably hasn't called for a ceasefire. But now he's actually gone further than just calling for a ceasefire. He's saying, like, I literally want to end U.S. funding to Israel. Okay, so I just need to show you, because fair is fair, objective is objective. This is what it took for Bernie to finally say, all right, no more U.S. money for this regime. 30,000 dead Palestinians, of which 27,681 are... civilians. That includes over 11,000 Palestinian children who've been killed in the carpet bombing. Nearly 59,000 injured people, 104 journalists who've been killed, and by the way, many of them, there's tremendous evidence that they've been targeted on purpose, including their families. And then, you, I mean, I've showed you guys these numbers before, but this is how, this is how far down the rabbit hole we are. 316 schools have been damaged, many of them directly bombed. 236 doctors and nurses have been killed. I mean, this is, we're witnessing an atrocity, the likes of which we haven't seen since literally Nazi Germany. The scope? The sc I, I would say that, uh, I would say that Israel is a Nazi regime. Like, I just showed you two examples. The first was gloating over the fact that no, nobody wants the Gazans and the Madagascar plan and the Congo plan. I mean, I don't even know why the Zionists bother to say Congo. Why not just say Madagascar? Make it identical. It's these unlettered American scum will never know anyway. They've never read a book about Nazi Germany. They've never studied genocide. They've never studied history. Why not just say the exact same shit as just quote Hitler? Just quote Hitler directly. What's the point? Why even bother with the tiny little evasions? Wouldn't it feel so much better just to embrace it? Volson, thanks for the prop. And by the way, chat, we started the stream today talking about how Biden is preparing to expand the war. Biden is ready to put you and me into a war in the Middle East. Iran, get nukes. Iran, get nukes. Get nukes. Get them quick. That's the only way to stop the insane United States from fucking trying to do a World War III. Jesus Christ, the Hassan, Hassanabi doctrine. Hassanabi doctrine activate. I mean, nobody's threatening to invade North Korea. scale, the time frame, the types of bombing and damages, this is off the charts. It's off the charts. So I'm happy Bernie came to the right position 
But also, let's be clear, it took 11,833 children who were carpet bombed before he said, ah, you know what? You went too far. You went too far. So here's what they say in Mediate. Senator Bernie Sanders held back held nothing back on Tuesday in issuing a very strongly worded condemnation of Israel's ongoing war against Hamas in Gaza while urging the U.S. to cut off funding for the conflict. Quote, let me be clear. No more U.S. funding for Netanyahu's illegal, immoral, brutal, and grossly disproportionate war against the Palestinian people. Congress must reject any effort to pass $10 billion of unconditional military aid for the right-wing Netanyahu government. So uh, let me just pause here to point out, this is good. This is good, but I'm, I get a little triggered now every time I see people be like, we must stop supporting the right-wing Netanyahu government. Guys, don't take my word for it. You go read what Yair Lapid has been saying. He's the opposition exactly. to Netanyahu. Yeah. You go listen to And this is actually a really well-argued point by Kyle, is this is not just the right-wing of Israel. This is Israel. his speeches. He sounds just like Netanyahu. Like, all of the top Israeli government officials sound exactly like Netanyahu. Like, the left-wing position in the Israeli government is, let's do an ethnic cleansing. Let's voluntarily relocate all the Palestinians in Gaza. The right-wing perspective is, nuke them, or do a genocide. So, I'm just, you know, I know I'm being nitpicky here, but at the same time, I feel like it's important to point out, I it, don't fall for the, like, well, we really got to stop this right-wing Netanyahu government. It's like, it, even if he's replaced, they will probably continue down a very, very similar path. And we need to be clear, until the war crimes stop, of course there should be no support at all. We should be talking about sanctioning Israeli government officials. We should be talking about condemning them at the UN. We should be talking about genocide charges at the International Court of Justice, which, by the way, credit to South Africa, that's exactly what they're doing. All right, let's continue. Sanders, the only Jewish presidential candidate to ever win a nominating contest, said on X slash Twitter, Sanders notably attributed the war in Gaza to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the right-wing Netanyahu government, not to Israel in general. He should talk about the rest of the Israeli government, because, again, they sound just like Netanyahu on this stuff. The Vermont senator's office released a full statement saying, quote, the issue we face with Israel-Gaza is not complicated. While we recognize that Hamas's barbaric ter terrorist attack began this war, we must also recognize that Israel's military response has been grossly disproportionate, immoral, and in violation of international law. Okay, so that's true, but I will say, October 7th was horrible. There were 45% of the people targeted by Hamas were civilians. 100% condemn that, that's horrible. 55% were military. Okay. Israel's targeted 92% innocent civilians. That's all really bad. Also, it is a little misleading to say it all started on October 7th. That's just not true. There were, like, hundreds of Palestinians who had been killed leading up to the attack on October 7th. So I just want to be accurate with our history here, right? And, of course, you have to bring up the whole history of the region and the endless occupation. Like, all that matters. So I get a little triggered when it's like, it all started on October 7th. You We've had 10 years of a stalled peace process, the discrediting and corruption of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, uh, 700,000 illegal West Bank settlers. The shooting of innocent March of Return protesters, dozens of them shot to death or maimed. Like, there is a formal system of apartheid. Like, Israeli settlers who live in the West Bank can vote in uh, Israel's elections. But Palestinians who live in the West Bank and who live under military occupation cannot. That is an apartheid, and it's based on race. It's not complicated. You could argue that this phase started on October 7th, but there was definitely things preceding that, which are crucial and vital context that shouldn't be ignored. All right, let's continue. And most importantly for Americans, we must understand that Israel's war against the Palestinian people has been significantly waged with U.S. bombs, artillery shells, and other forms of weaponry, and the results have been catastrophic. Since October 7th, over 22,000 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli strikes. Two-thirds of these victims have been women and children, and 57,000 have been wounded. Since the start of the war, 1.9 million Palestinian men, women, and children have been driven from their homes. 85% of the total population of Gaza, according to an analysis of satellite radar data, Nearly 70% of the housing units in Gaza have been destroyed or damaged by the Israeli bombardment. Today, not only are the vast majority of people in Gaza homeless, they lack food, water, medical supplies, and fuel. 
A recent UN report indicates that half of the population of about 2.2 million are at risk of starvation, and 90% say that they regularly go without food for a whole day. He's singing a really different tune now about this, isn't he? The chief economist at the World Food Program said the humanitarian disaster in Gaza is among the worst he has ever seen. This cannot be allowed to continue. Congress is working to pass a supplemental funding bill that includes $10 billion of unconditional military aid for the right-wing Netanyahu government to continue its brutal war against the Palestinian people. Enough is enough. Congress must reject that funding. The taxpayers of the United States must no longer be co complicit in destroying the lives of innocent men, women, and children. So look, it appears like he's hit some sort of a breaking point. But I will say... This, this is purely speculation on my point. Purely speculation. But here's my guess, man. First of all, everything he's been saying on this topic all along, he's been getting a torrent, an absolute tsunami of massive disagreement from people who normally absolutely love him. Did that impact him? Well, I don't know for the simple reason, I don't know if he reads social media, I don't know how much in touch he is with the actual grassroots. I mean, he's really old, right? Most people are usually are unplugged. Honestly, in a sense, that usually is more healthy than the younger generation that's, uh, that's always plugged in. But my guess is, look, Bernie is surrounded in, like, his staffers. These are all good, decent, caring people. These are all people with really good politics. Like, for example, I think of Warren Gunnels, his policy guy. Amazing guy. And you point, you pick somebody out in Bernie Sanders' office and in his inner circle, I'll show you somebody who is an incredibly decent person who may be even to the left of Bernie Sanders himself, okay? So my guess is, I think his uh, his inner circle got to him. I think they really, like, almost had an intervention and sat him down and were, was like, listen, man, the stuff you've been saying is totally unacceptable. We're witnessing what is effectively a genocide happening right in front of our eyes. If Israel wasn't trying to target innocent Palestinian civilians, why the hell did they do a medieval-style siege which punishes 2.3 million people? No food, no fuel, no water, no electricity, people drinking salt water to survive, kids getting their legs amputated without any anesthesia. What are we talking about? And you're going to go out there and push this narrative that Israel's doing a hunt for Hamas, like it's some sort of shitty action movie from 2007 funded by the CIA? What are we talking about here? This is absurd. They are doing a campaign of extermination. They are trying, at the very least, to ethnically cleanse Gaza. That's what's happening. And so I think the people in his inner circle, maybe even his wife, got to him and were like, you're just wrong. You're just wrong. Here, look at this statement from Doctors Without Borders. Here, look at this statement from Amnesty International. Here, look at this statement from Human Rights Watch. Here, look at what the Secretary General of the UN is saying. Here, look at this commentary look from the, the top Pope. Israeli government officials calling Palestinians human animals. Look at these multiple top Israeli officials floating nuking Gaza. Look at how closely the stuff they're saying mirrors a Nazi rhetoric. Look at this. Look at that. And I think that after a while, it became undeniable to him. So now he's out there saying, totally cut off the funding. He's 100% right about that. Again, I just wish there wasn't over 11,000 dead children already by the time he made that decision. But look, it's a complex issue, right? Because on the one hand, you always want to give somebody credit for coming to the right place. But on the other hand, you also want to be clear that we were already well past the point where this was absolutely unacceptable. Like, literally on October 9th, right? And here he is, in January. Like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, 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 too much. So, it's crazy. He's still, ne he, now he's surpassed all the other senators. There were many other senators and congresspeople who beat him to say ceasefire. Now he surpassed them by saying cutting off the funding. That's good. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's almost too little too late because I'm at the point now where you should be having statements coming out where, U.S. politicians absolutely support South Africa at the International Court of Justice trying to charge them with genocide, trying to charge Netanyahu and Ben Gavir and Smotrich and Israeli commanders and generals with genocide, because that's what they're doing, right? So I would say no more money for Israel, you know, no more funding, no more arms, no more weaponry, cut off all that stuff, allow the condemnations through with the United Nations, and at the same time, charge them with war crimes, because... If we don't, we've made a total farce of human rights and international law. And I want the Nuremberg Tribunal... It is, to it is a farce. It is a farce. Which has destroyed the development of humanity. The United States is the evil empire. It is an empire like every other empire before it. It has no values. And it's important for you to understand something. 
because I don't want you to be confused and think, well, okay, it's an empire, but it's my empire. I'm benefiting. No, you're not. I already proved it. There are $10,000 EVs in China. Solar panels are a third as expensive as they, in, in Australia as they are here. The empire is there for a specific class of 500 families of capitalists worldwide to take it all. And for you to have your funding cut for your kid's school, your roads to fall apart, to drink lead in your water, to have polluted air that gives you asthma and cancer, to have unaffordable health care, unaffordable housing, unaf everything is being exploited. You're the number one victim of the exploitation. You're where the money is. So don't think that this empire of America is benefiting Americans. It's benefiting the international capitalist class and them alone. They are trying to undermine and hollow out and suck dry every drop of profit they can from you. Who do you think is going to be sent to fight in these genocidal wars? The sons of the capitalists? That is what's going on here. So you should be ready. So the American empire falling for international cooperation would be an evolution of humanity. Geneva conventions and international law to matter. I want it to matter. John Fetterman so, with a dumb, another dumb statement. What a dumb son of a bitch. I haven't even read it yet. You also said at the time you were passionately opposed to BDS. This is before October 7th. Why? Because Israel is really a beacon of the kind of values, the American values and progressive ideals that you want to see. In that region, it's our strongest ally. We have a very special kind of relationship. I don't understand how we could vote against the Iron Dome or what to harm Israeli businesses or the nation or anything. I'll never understand that. Call them colonizers. Like, where does this come from? It must be TikTok or some kind of obscure classroom talk. As an alum of Harvard, look, I graduated 25 years ago. Of course, it was a little pinko, but now I don't recognize it. Uh, the, the, where their colonizers came from was from the, uh, first prime minister of Israel and the Zionist movements, leaders and writings. You know, we read the books where they call themselves colonizers. That's where we got it. We read the books that they wrote. I hope that it's not fake. We shall see. Hopefully they go down, and that's the stuff that U.S. politicians should be saying. But of course they're not going to, because where they are sort of guilty along with them, right? Because they keep greenlighting more money and more weapons as they see the genocide. So that would also sort of implicate them. So I doubt they're going to they're gonna support that. But that's what people should say. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop. And watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to. Where are they getting that? Is the Israeli values, huh? Israeli values, huh? Israeli values. Israeli calls for ethnic cleansing are only getting louder. Is this the is this the values, John Fetterman? Is this the progressive values? Nearly three months of war have left Gaza in ruins. Israel's quest to eradicate militant group Hamas after it carried out its deadly October seventh attack looks far from finished. No matter the skyrocketing death toll for Palestinians, more than 20,000 people have been killed in the Gaza Strip due to Israeli bombardments and the ongoing offensive. A sprawling humanitarian crisis has seen close to 90% of Gaza's displaced and the majority of the embattled territories, more than 2 million population teetering on the brink of famine. I've been to all kinds of conflicts and all kinds of crises, said Arif Hussein, chief economist for the UN's World Food Program. 
In my life, I've never seen anything like this in terms of severity, in terms of scale, and in terms of speed. The human misery unfurling across Gaza finds little sympathy in the Israeli public discourse where the priority remains the vanquishing of Hamas, for perpetrators of the single bloodiest slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust, and the freeing of hostages held in Hamas's Gazan redoubts. I, I love how, I love this kind of argument because it's like the majority of those killed by Hamas were military members enforcing a blockade. Like what is the, this, arg, this, this line is just so fucking pointless. Shut the fuck up. Indeed, a steady drumbeat of sound bites for the Israeli lawmakers and other politicos has urged an even more devastating fate for the territory. Members of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's right-wing coalition have called for the dropping of a nuclear bomb on densely populated Gaza, the total annihilation of the territory as a mark of retribution, and the miseration of its people to the point they have no choice but to abandon their homeland. The parliamentarian from Netanyahu's Likud party went on television and said it was clear to Israelis that all the Gazans need to be destroyed. Then Israel's amb ambassador in Britain told local radio that there was no solution for a country that to level every school, mosque, every second house in Gaza to degrade Hamas's military infrastructure. This accumulating rhetoric forms part of the 84-page application filed by the government of South Africa at the International Court of Justice, accusing Israel of actions that amount to genocide or failure to prevent genocide. Though it condemns Hamas's, Hamas's October 7th attack, the South Africa case argues no armed attack on a state's territory, no matter how serious, even an attack involving atrocity crimes, can provoke any possible justification for or defense to breaches of the Genocide Convention. Israel's military campaign in Gaza, it explains, has already laid waste to vast areas of Gaza, including entire neighborhoods, and has damaged or destroyed in excess of 350,000 Palestinian homes, rendering swaths of the territory uninhabitable for a long period of time to come. Israeli authorities claiming, claim the South Africa complaint have failed to suppress direct and public incitement to commit genocide from a host of Israeli politicians, journalists, and public officials. This includes far-right figures like Finance Minister Be Bezel Schmotrich and National Security Minister Itmar Ben-Gavir. Now, far-right figures that are ministers of the government. What needs to be done in the Gaza Strip is to encourage immigration, Smotrich said in an interview on Sunday with Israeli army radio. If there are 100,000 or 200,000 Arabs in Gaza and not 2.2 2 million Arabs, the entire discussion of the day after will be totally different. Chat, there it is again. There it is again. Ben Gavir separately called for a de facto forced migration of hundreds of thousands out of Gaza. U.S. and other Western officials condemn these statements as inflammatory and irresponsible, but such pushback is doing little to change the tone of the conflict. Netanyahu himself, according to my colleagues, tried to cajole Egypt and other Arab governments and many states elsewhere into taking Gazan refugee, a non-starter for many in the Middle East who fear further Palestinian dispossession of their lands. Israeli calls for de facto ethnic cleansing, a potential Israeli settlement of Gaza may not reflect the actual position of Israel's wartime cabin, cabinet. In private, Israeli officials say the proposals to relocate Gaza stem from political imperatives of Netanyahu's coalition and his dependence on far-right parties to maintain power. Hey, I'm glad that, uh, uh, that the Republicans trained the uh, American media to listen to Republicans in private as they publicly supported Trump lock, stock, and barrel. But the, hey, in private, they're doing good. Now in public, they're doing a genocide. Hmm. The professionals of the military and security establishment know that this is not in the realm of possibility. Oh, is that right? Do the professionals in the military? Hmm, the, the, the professionals in the military, chat. We're, we're, we've got the professionals. They're professionals in the military. They're professionals. They're the good guys. They're the good guys. They're the they're professionals. Professionals in the military. Professionals. 
Three Battalion 271 with a message to Hamas. Despite the 7th of October, despite dozens of days of fighting in the line, we are ready to talk about reconciliation, about new thinking, new building, a restoration of the Strip. Hey chat, you know what I don't hear? Any sounds of fighting. It's totally quiet. And he's out in the middle of a field looking at a camera. Making a TikTok. I don't think that there was an exigency for demolishing all those civilian buildings. <laughs> So what you're seeing is there is a mat there. They have uh, they have placed explosives within all these buildings. They mock the idea of reconciliation and peace, and then they demolish all of these civilian buildings with a uh, uh, with a massive explosion. Do you see? A multi-point explosion in all these buildings, destroying them. You can kind of see it. As he walks away, you can see some of the rubble is still in the air. Professionals in the military, I want you to know. A person directly familiar with conversations inside the Israeli government told the Washington Post, speaking on the condition of anonymity because they were not authorized, they know there is no future without Gazans in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority is part of the government. They know, huh? Says the anonymous quote. But Netanyahu and his allies remain conspicuously vague. This is has borrow, by, by the way. This is lying so that Americans have cover to do genocide support. But Netanyahu and his allies remain conspicuously vague about their imagined endgame for Gaza. That uncertainty, always, analysts contend, only deepens concerns about Israel's intent among its Arab neighbors. Including Gulf monarchies that were warming to the Jewish state. Nobody is going to take the steps that would proceed new normalization agreements when Netanyahu is rebuffing Arab states' demands on two-state political process and is also insisting they should fund Gaza reconstruction with no questions asked or strings attached. Iran and its proxies are not going to be deterred when visiting high-ranking U.S. officials repeatedly lay out their vision for a post-war Gaza and Israeli cabinet ministers fall over each other in their rush to the television studio to offer public rebuttals. They added, arguing that it was vital for the Biden administration to push the Israelis to face up to these realities. Meanwhile, a group of prominent Israelis, including former lawmakers, top scientists, and intellectuals, wrote a joint letter Wednesday condemning Israel's judicial authorities for not reigning in the genocidal rhetoric widely on show. For the first time that we can remember, the explicit calls to commit atrocious crimes as stated against millions of civilians have turned into a legitimate and regular part of Israeli discourse, they wrote. Today, calls of these types are an everyday matter in Israel. It's almost like they're fascists. Absolutely zero chance you could get a controlled demolition of that magnitude under fire or in a hostile AO. Implication is the buildings are completely abandoned and occupied. Yes, Caddy White, that was my point. The Israeli government and the military is complicit in ethnic cleansing and utter destruction of the Gaza Strip. This isn't a targeted campaign against militants. This isn't a counterinsurgency. This is a genocide. A knowing and practicable genocide. Sorry, I'll read this. Israeli soldiers abuse themselves in a house before boasting about burning it down in Gaza. Thank you, my dear. We are Duvdian. There's no meat in Gaza? What did you say? I said, wash the dishes. Come make some coffee. Come on, coffee. Liam, what? What? Did we finish? Are we leaving? What did you say? I said, get away. I want to demolish the house. My brother, I heard he burned it. The most moral army likes to have armored bulldozers to bulldoze civilian homes.
Wow, I just realized, chat, we are three hours and 45 minutes into the stream. And I never shilled. Now, I have a contractual obligation, chat, to ask you to please support the stream. If you enjoy content like this, or at least appreciate it, and see that it has a necessity. Do you see how, I've, how I have laid down irrefutably that Israel is committing a genocide? Do you see how I have analogized it and compared it to how the Nazi genocide of Jews took place? And how Israel is proceeding with exact measured steps in the way that it happened to the Jews? So if you want to have a content creator and news commentary available that looks at these things with clear eyes and without American exceptionalist bias, then you've got to support this stream in this community. That's the only way leftist content is going to be created, is if you, the viewer who's watching me now, directly support it through a grassroots effort. It's not going to exist. MSNBC would never hire me. It didn't matter if I had 50,000 viewers. I am persona non grata because I support a left-wing politics. That's the way it is. And the only way we're going to win is if we build our own institutions and we take over. If you're waiting on the institutions of liberalism to protect you, I have one thing to tell you, and it's not very complicated, chat. It's very obvious. Listen, it comes directly from Captain Picard. Don't trust the liberals. They will betray you. And just as, it's, as, as Joe Biden is showing, and Captain Picard says, don't trust the liberals. They will betray you. Bad luck, Junior. I became water. Red beard outlaw. Stateside apartheid. Anatherion, thank you for the tier two for four years. Not Christian F. Dr. Sal I Rise, thank you for the 1312 bits. Venom Code 85, Diab Diabetic Evangelical, Fenric Duskaller, Volson, Marble Honey, Chapter Thrive, The Savage Noble, Spin Box. Thank you all for supporting the stream. Oh, I just wanted to I just wanted to remind you guys of something that you may not have noticed. I updated DSA Pride. Everybody spam DSA Dance and DSA Pride in the chat. The, the DSA Pride has been upgraded. DSA Pride has been upgraded. You're welcome, chat. It matches DSA Dance. They're in sync now. It looks great. 4K remaster. I kind of liked how they were off, actually. Okay, dude. It looked terrible. That was a Picard, though. Don't trust the liberals. They will betray you. Who the hell do you think that was? Anyway, that was Lenin. Oh, it could be. Flame into being stateside apart. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the stream. We are a mere... 30 subs away from our sub goal. It's been tough. We've been struggling to reach the sub goal this week, chat. So if you can, please consider supporting us. It means a lot. It means a lot. All right, let's get back to the content. We're going to bring back an oldie, chat. I want to show you this. Look at the level of racism that you see. Miss Pastabot, thank you for the 10 tier ones. You say you don't approve of... And do you think that Israel is a democratic country? I Netanyahu know is that Israel is a democracy. They have elections. No. This man is now uh, has three, four courts against him because yes. of four cases of I know. corruption. 
This man knows okay. if the war we have, stops... We haven't got go time to, to do the entire history of Benjamin Netanyahu, what, who is not is a popular figure in Israel. This I, is, this is, I'm not, I'm not here to defend Benjamin Netanyahu. Right. Mustafa, is it whenever, possible to... Whenever I speak... Right. Whenever yeah. I speak about Palestinian rights or no. Palestinian situation, you, you claim it is history. I'm talking about what's happening today. No, I know, and this I'm is trying... not history. Can we... Can we <laughs> just... You you <laughs> sell, you talked about how you don't want Israel, Israel. You're saying Israel that October the seventh happened. You're placing that in historical context. I understand that. Please don't say that again. We don't have time for it. You've made that point five times already. I don't okay. know what you have time for. Oh my for. God! Let me for, for the love yourself. of God, let me finish the sentence, man. I don't. Maybe you're not used to women talking. I don't know. But I'd like to finish a sentence, sir. Anyway. So, no, you are misleading the public now really? by claiming Right, I've got 20 seconds left. I'm not even going to bother trying and to answer. Um, well, if you the, don't think Israel's reaction is acceptable, what would have been an acceptable reaction to you? You've got 10 seconds left. To end occupation and allow peace to prevail for both people. That's their reaction. Brilliant. Yeah. Sorry to have you know, been a woman speaking to you, but there you are. Doctor, you... I mean, the blatant racism, Islamophobia, it's bigotry that is considered acceptable. By the way, he was just saying that Netanyahu is a corrupt, he's facing four charges of corruption and is requiring, he has to stay prime minister to avoid going to prison. And the idea that Israel is a democracy when they have... 700,000 Israeli settlers are able to vote in uh, uh, Israeli elections, but 7 million Palestinians aren't, even though they're under occupation. And it's based on their race. That a Palestinian and an Israeli cannot get married in Israel. That's illegal. If, if an Israeli and a Palestinian go abroad to get married... Their marriage will not be recognized by the state of Israel. The Palestinian cannot move to Israel, even though they're the spouse of an Israeli citizen. This type of non miscegenation law comes right out of the American Jim Crow Deep South apartheid regime. What democratic country denies people access to their spouse based on that spouse's race? Can someone else give me an example? I feel so powerless with Zionist family who think all Gazans need to be purged and pushed to Egypt. That's fascism. Your, your family are fascists. Your family are Nazis. And here's the thing that people need to understand and recognize and take seriously is that this is not going to go the way that w all the Westerners think it's going to go. This war could expand. Let's take a look at right wing uh, newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, explaining the axis of resistance. And so I can debunk this dog shit fucking crap. Iran-backed groups form a land bridge across the Middle East and connect in an alliance that Tehran calls the Axis of Resistance. Its focus? To oppose the West. They can both transport equipment and personnel, but they can also use... To oppose the West. Baby brain bullshit. Octo Plus, thanks for the tier one. Position to attack U.S. interests. What are U.S. interests? Come on, explain it, expound. Threaten Israel closer to its borders. The alliance has been brought into focus amid the Hamas-Israel war, as the groups are mobilizing on multiple fronts. Whoa! At the same time. So here's how Iran built out the network across the Middle East, and what it means for the U.S. and Israel. So to show you where Iran's so-called axis of resistance works in the Middle East, we have Iran over here and then, of course, Hamas in Gaza over here on the, on the Mediterranean. There's another group that Iran supports in uh, Gaza called the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which is actually a closer ally of Iran ideologically, but also working out of Gaza here and also in the West Bank. Iran's most important uh, militia ally is Hezbollah here in Lebanon. Aside from that, they also have 
Syria's President Bashar al-Assad here, and various militant groups in Iraq. And then finally, they also have an alliance with the Houthis in Yemen down here, down here south. These connections allow Iran to expand its Man, influence. the United States has a lot of enemies. I wonder how that happened. Epic content as usual. One of the things that really bothers me, and thank you for the support, everybody, we we got pretty close to the hype to the uh, the sub goal. Thank you for the 36 subs and the 1312 bits. Means a lot. Appreciate you all. Just 11 away. Is the United States of America and is Miss Pastabod gave 11 gifted subs, making us hit the sub goal. Wow. Daily sub goal. Wow. Thank you. I appreciate you. But support understand is why does Hezbollah exist in Lebanon? Well, that's because Israel armed Cath uh, excuse me, Christian militias who went and did mass killings. That's why Hezbollah exists in the Middle East and make it easier for the country to transport military equipment, personnel and weapons through the region. One of Iran's aims in the Middle East is to always keep the fight, the military fight, as far away from its own borders as possible. And the presence of these military allies in the land bridge kind of helps it do that. To understand why Iran has this belt of influence in the region, we need to go back. Oh, to OK, place. let's go. Following the Iranian Revolution in 1979, Tehran has sought to exert military, cultural, and ideological dominance across the Middle East. That led to the creation <laughs> Iran did. of the Quds Force, a branch of the Iranian military, which was later led by Qasim Soleimani. Soleimani became famous in the West over the past decade or so because Iran decided to elevate his profile as the mastermind, the architect, behind this modern iteration of, of the axis of resistance. It, it has expanded the resistance from geographical territory of 2,000 square kilometers in southern Lebanon to a territory of half a million square kilometers. Later, That's what they quoted him? They quoted him talking about geography. They are scared shitless of any American learning a goddamn thing, huh? killed in a drone strike ordered by the US. Now he was killed when he was in Iraq, basically as a peace envoy. Ridiculous, thanks for the tier one. Appreciate it. Yes. Soleimani was plotting imminent and sinister attacks on American diplomats and military personnel, but we caught him in the act and terminated him. Now, imagine, again, I know this goes without saying, but imagine if there were attacks killing American politicians and generals and officials in third countries. The strike Insanity. was aimed at weakening Iran's ability to threaten American interests in Iraq and across the region. But that goal hasn't materialized. Wow. Iran has like continued work. to supply groups such as Hamas with weapons and training. On October 7th, Hamas, designated a terror organization by the US, launched a broad assault on Israel, killing 1,200. I love how we just say that Hamas killed the 1,200. Even So let's, uh, I have a question for you. Okay, let's say that you're a concentration camp guard and the, 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 the uh, inmates in the concentration camp grab some guns and they shoot their way out. They shoot their way out, they kill the guards on the walls, they, they push out into the neighboring territory of the country that supports the concentration camp, the civilians who support the concentration camp. And some of those civilians pick up weapons to start shooting at the concentration camp inmates because they escape from their concentration camp and they get killed. Now, is the civilian who picked up a gun and shot at the escaping concentration camp inmate, is he a civilian? What if when the, uh, uh, the military uh, reacting to the, uh, the concentration camp being breached sends in military attack helicopters and in a panic, they shoot a bunch of their own citizens? Did the concentration camp inmate kill those people too? Now, I'm not saying Hamas did not kill innocent civilians. They killed, they killed 
and they mutilated civilians. That many were killed in the crossfire. Many were de deliberately targeted. That is definitely the case. And I condemn those atro uh, atrocity uh, crimes as crimes against humanity and they should be punished for it. So at the end of the day, I find it fascinating that they say Hamas killed 1,200 without actually demonstrating that they killed the 1,200. I can't answer your question until you tell me which side has the white people, yeah. Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei said immediately after the attack that Iran did not have a hand in planning it, but supported it. To try and curb Iran's influence, the US works with allied countries to have a presence of bases and troops across the Middle East. Of course, Israel here and Saudi Arabia here as the two sort of main and closest allies against Iranian influence. Wow, those are the good guys, chat. Oh, is Israel the genocidal uh, uh, apartheid state and fascist state and the theocratic monarchy? They support American values. Jordan has also for very long been a, been a very firm U.S. ally, and it, the U.S. also has partners in the Gulf. The U.S. also has a presence in some of the countries where it's, where it's competing for influence with Iran, for example, in Iraq, of course, um, and the We're U.S. Losing. also still has a military presence in northern Syria, where it's been allied for many years with Kurdish forces in the fight against Islamic State, but now also maintains a military presence to sort of counter this Iranian land bridge. Man, uh, it seems like the U.S. is Iran really involved in a lot of countries in the Middle East. Tehran probably shouldn't be there. In this region have been particularly active since October 7th. So let's remove all of these and take a look at what's been happening. On October 7th, Hamas attacked Israel here on the border with Gaza. Israel responded with a major military offensive on Gaza. But Iran's allies have also responded to this Israeli uh, attack from different sides. Most importantly, the Hezbollah militia in the northern part with Israel has engaged in skirmishes with Israeli soldiers. Iranian militias in Syria have also gotten closer to the border where they have uh, engaged in skirmishes. That was showing Hezbollah destroying spying, uh, Israeli spy equipment. That's what that clip was. A Hezbollah video uh, of some sort of listening equipment or some sort of radar program system. I'm not sure what this system is, to be honest, chat. This is a video from Hezbollah showing them doing a targeted strike on listening equipment only. The northern part with Israel. A surgical strike. Engaged in skirmishes with Israeli soldiers. Iranian militias in Syria have also gotten closer to the border where they have uh, engaged in skirmishes. Down here in Yemen. The Iranian allied Houthi rebels have uh, both fired rockets at southern Israel, but also captured a vessel in the Red Sea. The Houthis also launched drones and missiles at other commercial vessels in the area. That led to a US-led multinational task force stepping in to try and protect one of the world's most vital shipping lanes. And elsewhere, Iranian-backed militias in Iraq and Syria conducted nearly 100 rocket attacks against US forces over the past two months, according to the Pentagon. Even though there's been these types of attacks with increased frequency over the past decade or so, in this context, of course, of course they compound pressure on Israel uh, and help sort of pressure Israel in this context where they are, where they are fighting Hamas in Gaza. Although Iran's axis of resistance has claimed attacks on multiple fronts amid the Hamas-Israel war, Middle East analysts believe a wider regional conflict is unlikely for now. Even though other parts of this alliance have distanced themselves from the October 7th attacks, the fact that it was a big attack on Israel has given the alliance a bit of momentum, but also put a little bit of pressure, to be honest, on some of the other uh, militant groups to, to both to strike a bit of Israel and, and to come to the defense of the Palestinians who are now under severe... Yeah, I heard about that, uh, only facts. In Gaza. It just, it's one of those things that's so unbelievable that it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's actually true. But just because something is true doesn't mean that you don't sound crazy saying it. So far, groups in the Alliance have been sticking to calculated and strategic strikes, rather than moves that could risk a full-blown conflict with Israel and its allies. Look at how- look at that fucking corpse. Ugh.
All right, chat. It's time for us to bring on one of America's greatest. One of the guys who led to uh, one of the funniest things that ever happened. Al Gore getting the election stolen from him and then being such a cuck little bitch. He let Bush do it. Ralph Nader. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with part two of our conversation with Ralph Nader, who has spent more than half a century working as a consumer advocate and corporate critic, and now has a new book out. It's titled The Rebellious CEO, 12 Leaders Who Did It Right. Some may be surprised, Ralph, to see you write this book. I mean, uh, you— um, Came famous for your book on safe at any speed. The design okay, actually, chat. Listen, I didn't realize this was thirty minutes. I I I miss I I miss saw. I didn't realize it was thirty fucking minutes. Instead, let's enjoy a little bit of DSA fish for Friday. Let's do a little bit of DSA fish. Because Hassan just put this out. This just dropped. And it's not stuff we've watched before. The most psychotic Zionist TikToks. Honestly, can I just say this? Can I say this about Hassan? Is he has just been like, I don't give a fuck if this is risky for my career. I'm going to do what's right. And he's just gone full blown all in with this coverage. What an amazingly awesome guy. Big respect. What's it with a uh, uh, Zionist making baby voice as they do war crimes? Is it because like a lot of pedophiles moved to Israel or what? Like, what is it? Hey, Chad, I don't see, you know, I don't see very much resistance happening, but I see the building, uh, detonating, uh, wire. Hmm. Israeli comedy is so psychotic, dude. Yeah, they're putting that in a mosque, by the way. I do not understand, like, how Israel is the least funny nation on the planet. Like, how did this happen? This is, like, almost as offensive. The, the, the lag of comedy and the lag of humor in this, in this ethno state, in this religious sub Jewish supremacist ethno Fascists state. Fascists aren't funny. Is so devoid of any f fraction of humor that it's almost as offensive as the ethnic cleansing and the continuation of the ethnic cleansing. Obviously, ethnic cleansing, much worse, but that's how bad their lack of humor is, and it blows my mind, okay? This isn't to minimize the impact of the atrocities, but this in and of itself is also an atrocity. If Israel wasn't doing an ethnic cleansing campaign in Gaza and we're pumping out these kinds of content, this kind of commentary, okay, I'd be like, no, that's that's a war crime that should be tried under the International Criminal Court. Matt Leib said this on his podcast, somehow Israelis are actively the most unfunniest even though Jews in America actually have humor. Yes, dude, that's it. Like the contributions to comedy from uh, uh, Jews all around the world with the exception of Israel, is so significant. And then you look at, like, Israel, and you're like, how is this possible? What happened? It isn't to say that, like, all Jewish people are funny in general. Of course not. Matt Lee's but podcast still, is pretty great. You don't yeah, got Matt's one really funny, funny motherfucker in Israel? What's happening? How? It's because they're all right-wing over there. Right-wing comedy is always terrible. Yeah, I mean, this is, like, this is straight up. This is stuff that, like, even the, the most aggressive, gross, daily wire watcher is not going to laugh at this, okay? If you're in America and you're, like, a daily wire watcher, you see this, and even then you're going to be like, oh, that's kind of gross. What are they doing? Chap, this is literally daily wire humor. Bro, I would, dude, I'm telling you, even daily wire is funnier than this. Here, let me show you another one. It's just like, what is what is humor in this regard? I guess he just didn't like want to show being, the mosque being, being destroyed. Being the least huh? funny you could be. Yeah, ma, ma, we saw this one earlier. 
אמרתי, כן, אתם נראים מדובדבן. אה, שוכרן יא חביבי, איכנא מן דובדבן. מדניה! מה? מה קרה לעזה? זה מצרים? מה אמרת? אמרתי, אני עושה כלים. בוא תעשה קפה. יאללה, תעל, עשיתי. ליאם! מה? מה, זהו, חוזרים? מה אמרת? אמרתי, יאללה, זוז, זוז, אני רוצה להרוס בתים. אח שלי, כבר שרפתי אותו, בוא, בוא. That's sick, man. It's just classic misdirection, I think. Speaking of comedy, this doesn't even work as like a joke. Like it doesn't have the structure of a joke. Now we have moved beyond someone attempting to do a joke to not even being able to construct. You're just supposed to be laughing with sadistic glee. It's not supposed to be a joke. You're just supposed to be laughing with sadistic glee the whole time that Israelis are... defiling this uh, civilian's home that are destroying their property and they can't do anything about it. You're supposed to feel fascistic. Um, the, the, the euphoria of supremacy. It's a joke. It That's what you're supposed to be doing. Sense. And I don't get it. Their humor makes their ethnic cleansing possible is required for the maintenance of their state. No, it's so bad. Like, this is worse than Babylon B, dude. I saw a Twitter thread the other day about how genocidal regimes can only find unity through dehumanizing algorithms. The January 6th only... documentary that was released by the Epoch Times today is the funniest thing I've seen. Fuck. I'm kind of tempted to do a January 6th stream. I'm a little bit tempted. But I want to get a bunch of lefty uh, content creators together and I want to play the board game. The January 6th board game. I want to get like uh, whoever's around here to come and play some January 6th board game with me. I don't think the board game is out yet though. They get more and more depraved over time. It just feels so weird. It's like when you stumble across something, like a, like a culty part of the internet, right? And you stumble across it, and you look at it from the outside, and you're like, what the hell's going on here? Like, they're having a great time in the in-group over there, right? Like, they're yucking it up, okay? It's, it's, real, it's a real yuck-yuck show, okay? They're yapping. They're having a great old time. And then you look at it from the outside, and you're like, you're filthy and gross. Like, what? That's so weird. Why do you operate like this? What? Like, look at yourself. Kind of like your entire year recap. Not necessarily. I was thinking about that as I was saying it. But like at least there's like things that you can point to in the end of the year recap that like everybody understands is like fun and cool. Every in-group has a level of what I'm describing. But this is, this is way beyond, right? This is like objectively an evil and immoral thing to do. And most human beings understand it as such. I mean, guys, this is like the American military did a better job of ensuring this kind of stuff doesn't happen in Iraq and Afghanistan. Wealth, re wealth redistribution went. Thank you for the prime and uh, meow tain cat. Thank you for the five tier ones. Very sweet of you. Wealth redistribution. Asanabi, no posters of naked girls, only toys. What the fuck is wrong? Why to you? What? It's his Reddit shelf. It's his Reddit shelf. And which it still did, right? But they did a decent enough job of like hiding it. You think uh, military veterans or, or active duty uh, uh, combat uh, service members don't have dark humor, I guess? They do, of course. But this is like Abu Ghraib happening every day and, and being Be right blasted on TikTok with the... the nation state celebrating it and welcoming it with open arms okay while simultaneously the rest of the Brandon, world is looking yeah. at it and going that's insane an opinion about war is a dynamic thing no less than an opinion about a restaurant remember how Romini pizza was considered good gourmet in the 80s you wouldn't eat there today even if it was served the same pieces and emek cheese and mushrooms from a box because there are tastier and healthier alternatives the war was also re uh reasonable and justified on october 7th but we are not on october 7th for a long time we drowned in gaza like we drowned in lebanon another tunnel less tunnel The overall picture will not change. Nothing stolen is returned in a heroic operation. Hamas does not evaporate. The Palestinians are not immigrants. At the same time, unpleasant to say, we ourselves became living. No rape in 2023 justifies the destruction of a mosque. 
in 2024, especially since the destruction does not solve the problem, it only makes it worse. Two million Palestinians live in Gaza. The more we destroy them, the more they will hate us, and rightfully so. And we haven't talked about the economy that is being destroyed, about the normal life that has disappeared, about Bibi not going home with the usurper government, and about a general feeling that we have turned into a jungle. Security is an important thing, but it's not the only thing that is important. Even a normal life has value, which is sometimes worth compromising for. I oppose the continuation of the war in its current form, because even if it adds some security, it's not worth the price. See, that's what it is. Do you understand? Like this is a this is an Israeli person who's like, yeah, no, it's valid to attack uh, Gaza, but but the reality is like you're not giving us security. That's an important change of reference, a uh, 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 important frame of reference, and an important shift. Now, obviously, if you're looking at it from the outside like we are, I mean, I know that that's not going to be giving additional security to Israelis. It never was, and it never was supposed to. The the notion that Israel makes Jews all around the world more secure is a ridiculous one. Israel can't even make Jewish people in Israel secure with its actions, right? With its consistent actions. If Israel genuinely cared about permanent security and made that its main goal, then they would have followed in the legacy of Yitzhak Rabin instead of assassinating him and then, you know, voting in his, uh, the, those who championed his assassination, right? Like the only way to ensure permanent security in the region was through cooperation and, uh, and, and a pathway towards uh, accepting a Palestinian. You know what would make America safe is we just started bombing and killing uh, Mexicans. That would be that would encourage encourage our uh, in, increase our concern uh, security. Oh wait, that's fucking insane. Mexico is like our second top trading partner, and they we have a ton of social and and, and economic and political links. And familial links and cultural links, it would be really insane to do that. To turn Mexico into a permanent hostile enemy. To treat Mexicans as second class citizens that live in America. That would be really bad, wouldn't it? Any time for the new Wisecrack video? Yeah. State with the right to return. They never did that and continued expanding in the West Bank because they ultimately wanted to maintain their ethno-state goals. That is not done at the interest of security for uh, Jews around the world and certainly not even Jews in Israel. Israeli comedian and soldier guy, guy uh, soldier Guy Hawkman, posted a video on social media where he can be seen playing on the Siena Beach in Gaza where he claims everything is ours. <laughs> From Israel, we want to do peace. Where are you from? <laughs> I'm from Israel. We want to do peace. <laughs> He's like, get out of here. Get the f out of here. <laughs> Normally, you'd be like, wow, that's anti-Semitic, dog. But then you're like, well, I mean, look at this dude's attitude. What's happening? Uh, it, it, it's basically the difference between, like, people constantly chirping at black people about, like, anti-white racism versus anti-black racism. One is institutionalized, systematized, and, and dealing a tremendous uh, amount of violence to a, a captive population. Quite the frankly, other I don't even think Hassan needed to go down this path and talk about this. I don't, know, they, I don't think this guy was trolling people and they told him to get lost. You don't even have to pretend that they're being bigoted. They're not. <laughs> he was trolling people. There is a result of that violence and experience You're not of that allowed violence to fly the developed... Palestinian flag in Israel. A, a negative attitude towards those who are often perpetuating said violence or legitimizing said violence until proven otherwise. Afghanistan. Afghanistan, wow, you are very stupid. But you lost to Saudi yesterday. So if from Israel, I can teach you how to beat Arabs. Women, beautiful. What? Not so much, not so much. <laughs> Why? And Chad, this was not after October 6th, this was January 3rd. Israel's Ben Gavir orders police to take down Palestinian flags. Testing limits of his authority. October no or January 9th, 2023. Itmar Ben Gavir, Israel's new hard right national security minister, has ordered police to remove any Palestinian flag in public, arguing that displaying it shows identification with terrorism.
Ben Gavir issued the order after the Palestinian flag was raised in northern Israel on Thursday by Karim Yunus, who had just been released from prison after serving 40 years for mur murdering an Israeli. Before the Oslo Accords, the Israeli government considered the Palestinian flag to be a symbol of terrorism. Chat. Before the Oslo Accords... Israelis police already have the power to take flags away in circumstances. In the past year, they have taken Palestinian flags away from borders at the funeral of El Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akla and Israeli flags from Jews on the Temple Mount. Oh, poof, yeah. Okay. Okay, CNN. Democracy, by the way. Our hey, values, what, by the way. This? Jerk store, thanks for the tier one. Welcome back, brother. Where is Israel? Where is Israel? You have Israel. Only Palestine. No, this is Israel. We will fight to death to bring our hostages. But you know what will be Whoa. the picture of the victory? <laughs> the victory will be when Gaza will go in fire. Is this guy dead? No, he's not. He's very much alive. What he has killed, however, is not Gazan civilians, but instead specifically comedy. He has murdered comedy. He has specifically destroyed uh, the concept. Gaza of will be in flames. He's, he's wow, cool. This video cool is guy. disguised as comedy, but the main objective is to show Israeli how much Muslims hate Israel despite the attack and the hostage situation. No, I know what he's trying to do. He's trying to be like, oh, I'm from Israel. Look, see, I just went over here. I mean, dude, this is like what this guy is doing is yet another yet another version of like right wing trolling. Right. I'll bring it back to the United States of America for you to be able to comprehend it. What's that guy that goes up to like AOC and is like nice ass? You know what I mean? And then like tries to get himself in situations where like people yell at him. I don't even want to say his name. But it's basically that Nazi guy. It's basically the same. It's basically the same as like right wing trolling, Steven Crowder style right wing trolling. Easy pronounced. That's get the tier two. To yell at you to show how hysterical and silly they are. To go, oh, look at me. I'm just a small bean guy. I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything at all. That's it. That's his, his job is trolling at this point. Uh, and, and yes, rage baiting. That's his goal. Because he has no way of like creating anything humorous in and of itself. Here's an attempt at creating something humorous by Daniel Ryan Spaulding. Let's take a look. Hi, I'm Mr. Daniel, and this is my friend, the purple hair girl. She's not a bad person, but she's been radicalized to become a raging Jew hater, and we want to help her. Hello, Zionist pink washer. Purple hair girl, I heard you chanting. Yes, it's my favorite song. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I see. Do you know what that means, purple hair girl? Yes, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib explained it's a call for Palestinian freedom. Do you know which river? Do you know which sea? The Ganges to the Indian Ocean, the Caspian Sea. I want to die so bad when I see stuff like this. This is like... This <laughs> he is invented someone who doesn't know what they're talking about to be mad at. Easy pronounce time. Thanks for the tier two. John Draws, thanks for the tier one. Admitted flug of the tier one. Roms, thank you for the prime. This guy has to invade. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> What's, what river, chat? What river? Oh, what, what sea? So difficult. This is self harm, I think. Watching any attempt at like uh, the Jordan River, the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah, exactly. That's why they call it the West Bank because it's the West Bank of the Jordan River. Humor that is pro Israel, pro Zionism is just is is unironically self harm. I think. Okay, I would rather watch SNL, dude. This is it, it's really bad. It's so bad. But there's a lot that's funny here, at least in the analysis of this, right? Like, where's the humor in this? Where's the joke? The joke is that, uh, I guess, blue-haired liberals are now purple-haired, okay? And the woke SJWs are Jew haters. That's the joke. Because they don't want Israel to do an ethnic cleansing campaign. That is where the, the humor is, I guess. Actually, it's something Hamas terrorists chant, and it means the complete destruction of Israel from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River and the genocide of the Jewish people. Well, I don't mean it like that. 
the funny thing is like or the issue is like if israel is not doing an ethnic cleansing campaign i think you have more mileage and bandwidth to make normies feel as though uh you're the victim here but because israel is so openly loudly proudly declaring that they're doing an ethnic cleansing campaign and they love it when you turn around and you say well actually defending yourself against Nina this Turner's Petra, that's the, problem. the apartheid regime is actually uh, offensive and, and violent towards Jewish people. That means you want the ethnic cleansing of Jews. You're, for no reason whatsoever, making people in the edges agree with positions that are inherently violent towards Israel and towards Jewish people across the board. There's no reason where you ever have to hand it to people who might have genuinely violent opinions and interests. It's akin to saying... Like what Israel is actually doing and what Israeli officials are actually saying that they're doing and what Israel is actually genuinely defending, ethnic cleansing in Gaza, is actually blood libel. When you say that, and because anti-Semitism is a permanent bigotry, it is a, it is a bigotry that is very pervasive. It's the oldest kind of bigotry too. When you take the very real instances of blood libel and you try to put that into a situation where there is no blood libel happening when people are just genuinely accurately describing the situation in front of their eyes you all of a sudden end up muddying the waters about blood libel in general let's watch let's continue watching this this nuclear grade uh enriched uranium cringe hey purple hair girl when someone doesn't acknowledge a trans person's pronouns that's transphobic Yes, it is. And when you ask a person of color where they're actually from, that's racist. Right. And when a Jewish person tells you not to use a chant that's associated with their genocide. And there is no, there is no association between from the river to the sea <laughs> to the Holocaust. What river do you think it is? The Danube to the Adriatic? Like, what the fuck are you talking about? That's Zionist oppression. <laughs> That's uh, sick, man. Yeah, the difference is like when a white person says cracker is the worst slur that they've ever heard and tells you that you shouldn't do that. That framing is, is completely devoid of any kind of power structure. Israel is completely separated from Jews and Jewish people and anti-Semitism. Israel is an oppressive apartheid regime currently engaging in an act of ethnic cleansing. Even without the mowing the lawn operation that Israel routinely has engaged in in the Gaza Strip, it still doesn't change the reality. Even when it's not doing that, Israel is still maintaining an apartheid regime. Calling that out or any kind of slogans against that being considered anti-Semitic is silly. As I've repeated time and time again, criticizing the Saudi government or the Saudi administration and its actions in Yemen against the population of Yemen, which, uh, you know, was uh, roundly declared uh, ethnic cleansing and, and genocide, by the way, is not Islamophobic. Nobody will tell you that it's Islamophobic. You can criticize, I guess, Saudi Arabia or Qatar from an Islamophobic perspective, certainly. But on its face, criticizing Saudi for doing genocide in Yemen is not Islamophobic. Just like criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic. That's it. Don't you think it's odd that the only minority whose voice doesn't seem to matter to purple hair girl is Jewish people? It's almost as if it's such an old- Guys. I'm sorry, I can't get my eyes off this guy's ears. What the fuck? They're dinner plates. He's got to be in Mossad because he's got some fucking sound absorbers right there. Jesus, my Lord in heaven. Anyway, focusing on what he was saying. Um, it's one of the most hilarious things I've ever seen is people saying it's, it's racist and anti-Semitic of you to say don't kill babies. Old ancient form of hatred that people with evil ideologies know this. Yeah, Hamas is like not busy fighting against an apartheid regime that is currently dealing death and destruction in Gaza, but instead is tailoring their messaging to Berkeley purple haired girls. They're they're certainly always like they're like, yeah, Abu Abaida is just like sitting in the in the cut, looking at Tumblr.
and being like, man, we are doing such a good job, such a profoundly good job, bros. I love it. Oh my God, all of these dumbasses, bro. There's like bombs blowing up ahead, uh, upside, uh, you know, up top. And they're like, yes, bro. Thank God. Thank Allah. We found a way to get non-binary people to be on board. They obviously are the movers and shakers of American society. Everybody knows when you get non-binary people on board, that means you win the war, the moral war. I'm not brainwashed. I just think rape is an act of resistance when people are oppressed by Zionist colonialist apartheid oppressors. I'm literally is Nobody says that. Nobody says that. Nobody says that. But it is a pretty common trope to accuse the people resisting their uh, oppression to be rapists. Hmm. Interesting. Single person that has said this. There is not a single person that has said that ever. People are so desperate to defend and- The most hilarious thing about this is the Hasbara push that Hamas has all this uh, uh, significant of a social engineering operation as the Israeli government and its puppets of the West, APAC and the ADL. That's just beginning. That's just the beginning. There are Zionists chalk through all sorts of important um, areas of, uh, of American life. Like, uh, just look at the, uh, go look at the, um, the Democratic Majority for Israel super PAC. Go look at how uh, there was money that came from both big Republican donors and big re uh, Democrat donors. Uh, oh, no, it was the Nicholas Sabin, the fucking Power Rangers guy, the guy who's basically, the, I, I should call him the Power Rangers guy, the middleman who bought Power Rangers for cheap in Japan and then brought it to America and became a billionaire. Sabin said that he, he just loved being a Democrat. He didn't have any politics. And then suddenly it turns out that he did have politics. You better support Israel on everything. That's the only issue he cares about. That's spy shit. In case you're wondering... I've seen that before. But again, Israeli spies are never punished in America. Tenable, unmanageable position that they just make stuff up. You have to make stuff up. This is peak winning made up argument and shower energy. Yeah. This is seriously the Zionist equivalent of all lives matter. Yes, it is. Except the difference is everybody under a white supremacy structure kind of understands, like, unless you are literally just a predator, I guess, or a, just a completely delusional racist person, like a white identitarian, that, you know, anti-white sentiment is, is not something that is, like, genuinely harmful, right? It's not a real thing. It's not a real harmful thing in the same way that, like, anti-black sentiment is in a white supremacist society. However... Anti-Semitism is real. That's the major difference here. Anti-Semitism is real. It's a real bigotry. And not in a way where, uh, you know, anti-white sentiment is. So these guys are using a real bigotry and trying to marry it with a false bigotry against a dominant group engaging in acts that are completely unjustifiable. That's the problem. And the hilarious part about it is that it just, like, completely shows, like, the other person being a purple-haired girl is the SJW concept, right? Like, yeah. this guy is is saying, like, you're an SJW, you love identity politics, but it's actually bullshit. All identity politics is bullshit, except for my identity. Please care about my identity exactly. politics, and I'm going to weaponize. Which is what Felix was saying, and he is completely correct. No one is against identity politics. They just want Gushers to acknowledge them as the true protagonist of history instead of somebody else. I think he means Gushers as in, like, what, the, the purple-haired girl? Is that what he's saying? These blue-haired girls are so annoying. They don't realize that everyone wants me dead, and they're not even grateful for ways. You just hard feeling <laughs> taking the check, pay for his rent this month. No, I don't think that's the APAC check. Okay, I think it's more so he just wants to be funny desperately while simultaneously trying to make a point. And it's very difficult to make an ideological point while you're trying to to be funny to begin with. It's additionally harder to try and be funny. When uh, uh, your the ideological point you're trying to make is just not going to be received positively by a broader population. This is an armored bulldozer chat. They're in the Cat Nine, by the way. This yeah. is the IDF bulldozer that Caterpillar makes specifically for the IDF. <laughs> Uh, 
It must be nice loving what you do. Yeah. Do what you love and it, and every day will seem like a holiday. It will never feel like you're working. And what these guys love is reducing children's bedrooms into rubble. Just bros being dudes, man. You too sensitive. Exactly. They're singing about God protecting them. How does someone get this depraved? Because I can't believe this is real, bro. What the fuck is this? Um, how does someone get this depraved is a great question. It's called years and years and years of maintaining an apartheid regime and the racist agitative propaganda that you have to consistently subject your population to in an effort to maintain this apartheid. And that comes from dehumanizing Palestinians, saying they're all terrorists, saying their children are terrorists and the like. Israel does this quite a lot. Israel has done this quite a lot. This is what happens when you do it. It's called believing everyone in Gaza is Hamas and every building in Ho is Hamas infrastructure. No, it's, it's called believing every Muslim Arab is a terrorist too. It's not no, it's called believing in supremacy and wanting to destroy the untermensch. It's fascism 101. They just believe that it, Arabs, uh, God gave them that land and it, they don't even really believe in God. It's more an exercise of sadistic power, of domination. It's domination euphoria. Basically, I get to do whatever I want. You have to suffer. Makes a person feel secure and powerful. It's a psychological effect of being a sadist and an oppressor. They get dopamine out of it. Just like Gaza. Nazi I shit. I think that it's yes. certainly beyond that. Across the board, every Arab is out to get us. We are uh, the chosen sons. Some believe it, some don't. Doesn't matter. It's not just necessarily like feeling that you are the chosen sons and daughters of God, but instead the elitist attitude that you have is a colonial force. That elitist attitude, that superiority complex is reinforced through religion in some instances and in other instances it could be completely devoid of religious text. But that's how it works. It's, it's not dissimilar to white supremacy. It is very similar to white supremacy. Obviously the people are not white. Does Netanyahu believe the religious justification? I mean, I don't know. I don't know how religious he actually is. It doesn't matter though. Religion is simply a tool, guys. Bolivar Zilianski says, people don't understand how the occupation morally degenerates the occupier. Kind of like how Frederick Douglass talked about one of his slaveholder's wives who started out nice, but got so used to slavery with time and got crueler. The idea that religion plays an active role in this conflict beyond just like reaffirming people's uh, important beliefs to continue the maintenance of this conflict and the maintenance of this ethnic cleansing is, is silly. Anyone who tells you like, this is a religious war is just ridiculous. They do use religious symbolism. Israel uses religious symbolism, Hamas, and, and Palestinians use religious symbolism as well in an effort to, in an effort to, to say like, no, our cause is just, but it's way beyond that. Like religion is just seasoning. Religion is a motivator. Exactly. Religion is a good and very powerful tool to motivate, galvanize, uh, and, and, and organize. It's just, it's nothing beyond that. It's just a tool, not a real reason. We went past segment of the broadcast, but something Israel is doing now gives off uh, vibes uh, from the US back then. Oh yeah, here. I mean, yeah, this video was made during the 2003 U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq. At first, I thought he's putting out the fire. Then I realized that the American army was actually liberating the Iraqi palm trees from tyranny and bringing them democracy. Where did the Israelis get it from? No. It, all, it, it also reminds me of that uh, video. But, but once again, it's oftentimes not the soldiers themselves posting this stuff, right? But it reminds me of that video that is... Uh, remained in my mind it's just like permanently scarred my brain of the taxi driver i think it was in iraq might have been in afghanistan but i think it was in iraq the taxi driver in iraq uh coming up to the occupying american forces uh they're claiming that he stole wood uh the the soldiers push the iraqi taxi driver aside and then they drive a tank over his cab destroying his livelihood it's like there is no need to do that you did not need to do that at all. You just did that because you're... Oh, yeah, that's from, uh, that's from uh, Fahrenheit 9-11. I'll just show it to you. I'll find it.
Yeah, I think I did. That wasn't the scene I was thinking of, but you get the point. A disgusting savage. You're a monster. And you did that specifically because you are reaffirmed by other monsters in your vicinity. You do not see the people that you're dealing with as human beings. It's brutal. Israel does that on a daily basis, is what I'm saying. And that is not good. And it's certainly not funny. All I can say is, you know, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is, you know? I think people shouldn't underestimate the pleasure that these people are getting from doing their evil shit. All right, well, you know what, Chad? I'm going to duck out a little early after seeing all that shit. None of those people were punished. It's important to remember that. Um, here's all my links. Follow me on the YouTube. Here's my Twitter. Well, there's the Discord community. Remember, we have ourselves a new WoW guild on the Crusader Strike server and Season of Discovery. Every Friday, we have movie night. At 9 p.m. Eastern on the Discord, I'll do the Discord link again. We watch a movie together. 10, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. You can come hang out. This week, I think people wanted to watch Barbie. So we're going to be watching. We're going to be doing a Barbenheimer over the next two weeks. We're watching Barbie this week. We're watching Oppenheimer next week. So come hang out. I haven't actually seen I haven't actually seen Barbie yet, so you're gonna be seeing my live reaction. You I'll show you should come down to the March of Washington DC. Ooh, yeah, that's a good idea. Alright, everybody. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. I'm gonna to send you over to a, a stream that proves something deep about the yearnings for madness that we all feel also known as the VO stream if you would like to look into the maw of madness if you want to see what mental illness and uh, determination and just ruthless unstoppable noise <laughs> then please enjoy the VO stream. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. We'll be back on probably Monday. Um, hope you have a good weekend. Don't forget to come hang out if uh, with all my links. And uh, what's the ticker at these days? I don't know. I think VO is somewhere in the 5,000 range for the IAGA-thon. 5,000 subs in the IIathon. It's madness. All right, everybody. Stay safe out there. Solidarity forever. That's how, that's how we're going to win. All right, everybody. Peace out.